Good morning to all of you. A warm welcome to our Zoom webinar organized by GMOS Free Knowledge Academy. Today, our lecture is going to be on approach to chest pain in emergency department. Kindly mute your microphone and turn off your camera during the presentation and you can use the chat box to clear your doubts at the end of the session. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chamar Virugudarachi, Acting Consultant Emergency Physician attached to District General Hospital, Chilao. Over to you, sir. Perfect, thank you. And good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And my sincere thanks to GMO and Sri Knowledge Academy for initiating this very nice and uh, timely uh, program to uplift, uplift the knowledge in between doctors, knowledge, attitudes, and skills of the doctors. And uh, it's, I think it's a great pleasure for me to share my knowledge and uh, skills with you. At the same time, I gained lots of things from similar programs which has happened in the past. So today, uh, the topic I was given is the approach to chest pain in the emergency department. So I, I am supposed to um, talk about this approach within the next one hour. Let's see how to do that. Uh, I will start this talk with a sad story. A couple of years ago, when I was a first year uh, registrar, uh, there was a male in his mid 40s came with typical chest pain. I will describe what is this typical means. Typical chest pain, normal vitals except hypertension, and he has got uh, inferior myocardial infarction in the ECG. And he didn't have any difference in the blood pressures. He didn't. He complained of some back pain, but it was not that convincing to say that's radiant through to the back. Uh, and uh, we didn't have any focus or point of care, some scan facilities at that time. And uh, so we finally decided to uh, give fibrinolytics with streptokinase uh, since we don't have PCA facilities. We gave uh, fibrinolytics and the uh, patient uh, chest pain did not resolve and the uh, patient is changing as a persistence so we transferred the patient to college unit for risk to pci a couple of days after actually one of my colleagues senior colleagues who was a college senior registrar met me and told me thank you very much for the referral but unfortunately patient is no more uh the reason has been that they have found uh maybe i think after the uh angiogram uh uh grade one type one nautic dissection and uh, they have tried some cardiothoracic referral but unfortunately uh, they couldn't save the patient so i'm pretty sure you most of you might have similar story like that and uh, i have some couple of other stories as well i will tell in between the lecture so everyone of us can make some errors because this is a very tricky presentation and uh, there can be lots of overlaps and mistakes so keeping that in mind let's see what is my approach or what is the emergency department approach to chest pain the basically we are worried about chest pain due to various reasons the first thing is it's common it's very common it, the international data suggests that it is one of the most common ED presentations in the European and developed countries. In a study done in 2016 in Kurangal Hospital, they have found that out of 50,000 annual admissions for the emergency department, about 55% were medical admissions and 34% of admissions were related to chest pain. So that's a huge amount, huge. And so that these patients are our patients those are the patients with chest pain and the other thing we know that the chest pain can arise from anything it can be due to a problem with the organ or system the chest wall or the chest cavity it can be heart it can be great vessel it can be the lung it can be the pleura it can be the esophagus it can be the chest wall and it can be some abdominal or interabdominal organ like pancreas and the gallbladder, stomach, and it can be something distant due to referred pain. So it can be of anything, any organ or any system. And out of these causes, most of the causes are benign, few are fatal. 
how to identify these fatal illnesses from benign causes. And we all know that the visceral efferent systems of our chest wall, they have overlaps so that from the type of the pain, from the associated symptoms, we can't exactly say this pain arising from this, this pain arises from the heart, this one is from the esophagus, this one is from the, uh, from the pleura. So there are lots of overlaps. And even though I'm going to discuss about typical presentations, there are lots of atypical presentations. So the atypical presentations are typical. And as you all might know, so we are in the process of introducing the emergency medicine concept to this country, which is in the developed world. The emergency departments are meant to identify critical illness in the, illnesses in the patient and stabilize them and start appropriate management and hand over to the inpatient specialists. But at the same time, we are expected to discharge patient without significant illness, patients who are having benign pathologies. How to do that? It's very tricky. That's why it's, it's said that out of 6% of discharge from the UK emergency department, and this is one study, subsequently they were found to have 6% of them found to have significant, prognostically significant myocardial damage. So errors can happen. Our idea is to minimize errors. Let's see how we are going to do that. So I said there can be many causes for chest pain. So some are imminently or potentially life threatening. So we need to identify them. We can't miss and we need to come quickly and robustly manage them. On the other hand, there can be some benign pathologies. Only thing we need to do is send them home with some reassurance and with some safety network and there are some other causes which have specific identifiable cause which has to be managed maybe in the emergency department maybe in the inpatient ward or maybe able to discharge with some treatment so there are some other categories as well so our idea is to identify these three categories as much as we can without compromising patient safety So, as I mentioned, the causes for chest pain can be cardiovascular, pulmonary, musculoskeletal, gastrointestinal, or anything, any, any other thing. Out of these things, the most worried diagnoses are these fatal things, big six. Acute myocardial infarction, or acute coronary syndrome, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, pericard tamponade, tension pneumothorax, and insulin rupture. And there are some urgent identities a condition which should be identified like pericarditis, unstable angina, simple pneumothorax, even though they are not immediate life threatening, they have to manage, be managed. And there are some non urgent causes as well. We will go through these diagnoses as much as we can as time permits and see how can how we can minimize errors. Okay. Now we are going to the assessment part. If you want to take one take home message from this lecture, keep this circle in your mind. So, this is the most important thing in my lecture. So, the assessment of a patient with chest pain. Since you have already had some couple of uh, emergency medicine related lectures in the past, you might have heard about the approach to a critically ill patient or the emergency department patient. So, chest pain is a critical symptom. It's a concerning symptom. So, the, all the patients from the emergency department, so we are now implementing the RAP system in most of the hospitals. So, in, it's in the process. So, they have to be, they have to be categorized. Chest pain, symptom-wise, it's a category two for urgent patients. If they are having some hemodynamic compromise, they will be category one, but this is definitely a category two presentation. So they are prioritized. So they have to be taken to a bed and a monitored bed and do the initial stabilization. And then after the patient is stabilized, 
A, B, C, D, E. We have going through the directed history and examination of the stable patient. And from that directed history and examination, we can have some idea about the risk of the patient for a particular disease so that we can guide the relevant investigations. And from the investigations, with the history and examination, we can go for the definitive management. And then we can think of the ongoing care and disposal whether we send the patient home or whether the patient is going to the ICU or to the board. Now let's see how we are going to do this initial stabilization. For example, patient is coming with chest pain. So triage category two, initial stabilization. So if the patient comes with chest pain with severe dyspnea, we have to prop the patient up. If the patient comes with severe shock, we have to keep the patient lie down. So that is a position. And we have to assess the ARV, whether it is patent, whether the patient needs additional oxygen. In a critical patient, we can do oxygen. And later, we can reduce oxygen if, it's, if the patient is there to strive a heart infarction and the saturated target is 95. That's a different thing. But if the patient is a critical patient, assess the ARV, administer oxygen, and stabilize the ARV. And breathe. What is the respiratory? What is the air entry? What is the saturation? What is the work of breathing? Assume the patient comes with respiratory rate of 40 with unilateral absent breath sounds, hyperresonant chest, blood pressure 80 by 50. This patient is having a tension in the So initial stabilization means before going to the directed history, we identify a life-threatening, imminently life-threatening condition like tension pneumothorax. So we have already covered one of the big six, one of the major causes of chest pain, fatal causes, tension pneumothorax in the initial stabilization. We don't need anything. What we need is just methodical approach for the initial stabilization and assessment. So once we have tension pneumothorax, we don't need the decompression. And that's it. It's done. And then you go for the circulation. Assume the patient's uh, patient come with heart rate of around 180, 200, and blood pressure 80 by 50, drowsy, and uh, patient have the when you connect the patient to the ECG monitor, you get this. Don't wait the ECG technician to come and give an ECG of a VT or ventricular fibrillation. If the patient is having compromised circulation that has to be addressed with the cardiac monitor, you can diagnose the VT with the hemodynamic compromise and manage that with the synchronized DC cardioversion. Oh, if the so you don't have to wait for the EC technician to come and do an ECG and show that a, a ECG with a VT. Oh, definitely not the ECG of a VF, to find out that the patient is not breathing. That's the importance of initial stabilization. And then assume the patient comes with a blood heart rate of 25, blood pressure 70 by 50, and uh, drowsy. And uh, we don't know what's going on, but this patient needs to be managed immediately in bradycardia algorithm. If the patient is stable, yes, you can have as, uh, as soon as possible to get an uh, 12 lead ECG for the diagnosis of what is the block patient is having. But the initial stabilization means you identify immediately the isolating courses in, and manage it at that point. And then disability. What is the GCS? Whether there's any posturing. If the patient comes with chest pain, having some uh, low GCS, that is not typical of an MI. Something wrong is going on. So exposure like that. So that is the part of initial stabilization. Assume now we have stabilized the patient, gone through the ABCD approach, and we have identified the we have stabilized the patient. And then directed history and examination. Now this patient comes with chest pain. So the presenting complaint is pain. And in our medical school life, we are told that we have to take a comprehensive pain history with the Socrates. 
demon. I never understood the importance of this directed comprehensive history in my medical school life. If any one of my colleagues is here in this lecture, they will agree with me. I never understood that until I got to know that that is the only way of escape in front of a critically ill patient most of the time. So the history, even though we are working in emergency department, we can't work as robots. We have to take comprehensive history for the risk assessment and ident to identify the pathology behind. So that is very important. So the Socrates, it's very important. Ask when this pain started and what were you doing while this pain, whether you were watching television, whether you, are you, uh, whether you were gardening, if you were gardening, whether it's a strenuous work or whether it's a light work like pruning and uh, how did it start, it, whether it started very rapidly or whether it gradually uh, developed over time and what is the character, whether you feel like an elephant sitting on your chest or whether it is something very sharp and where does it radiate, what are the associated but whether it is nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis and how this uh, pain has evolved over time, how long this initial chest pain lasted and what do you do for that? Did you take any medication for that? And how many times from the time of onset, how many times did you have the similar pain? And whether there's an exacerbation of relieving factors and the severity, if possible to get a numerical scale to rate this pain out of zero to 10. That is important. So that is the pain assessment from, from that history. You can have some idea. This pain sounds like this pathology, sounds like this, sound like this. We can put into some box of uh, etiology so that you have some idea where I'm going. And then in the history, then we assess the risk factors. What are the risk factors if, the, if, if this patient's pain is suggestive of uh, acute coronary syndrome? So what are the risk factors this patient has? And if the, this, this pain sounds like pulmonary embolism, so what are the risk factors? So risk factors analysis, then that is the next step. And then we can shortlist your differential diagnosis. And then you can go for the directed examination. Let's see how we're going to do that. And then we can shortlist. And a couple of the most important questions I usually ask is whether you have similar pain before. And what do you do for that? Whether you were investigated, what are the investigation findings? If the patient has got a similar pain in the past and he has got a stress test and uh, full comprehensive cardiac workup and found to be normal, that is reassuring, not 100%, but it's reassuring. And uh, like that, so whether the patient has got recent bypass surgery, whether the patient has got recent uh, PCIs, that is very concerning in that case. So like that, that history is important. And risk assessment, as I mentioned, if it is a cardiac cause, slightly cardiac cause, there are heart score, TME score, base score to just to guide us. What are the next step of manage what is the next step of investigation what is the next step of disposition if it is a pulmonary impulse what is what's what's the wells criteria what's the wells code so we'll discuss very briefly and so basically while we are assessing a chest pain the ecg is number one and then checks x ray is very helpful and now in emergency department we have got point of care sound scan so that for most of these Pathologies, we have some kind of going the point of care, some scans, so it has been widely used, and troponini and ancillary investigations guided by history, examination risk, as that means whether we are going for a CT scan, we can't do CT scan for everyone. So we have to very carefully identify who needs a CT scan, who needs uh, further investigations. So that is the basic workup of any patient with chest pain. Right, and now we will go for the next step. So, so the big six, the most fatal big six. Okay, so as I mentioned before, 
big cyst means acute coronary syndrome so it should be corrected as acute coronary syndrome actually and otic dissection pulmonary embolism tension pneumothorax pericardial tamponade and esophageal rupture or mediastinitis so i will go through these topics briefly i'm pretty sure during the uh, in near future you will have dedicated uh, lectures for each and every condition so that i will not be able to address and cover full myocardial infarction full pulmonary embolism from this lecture so it's not a part of this uh, lecture uh, the scope of this lecture and uh, we'll go through briefly highlighting on the historical examination and risk assessment parts of identifying these illnesses in the human emergency department fine acute myocardial infarction or acute coronary syndrome acute coronary syndrome include unstable angina non stemi and stemi uh so definitely these patients need to be admitted and they have their own specific management stable angina also if it is concerning might need to be admitted so how to identify acute coronary syndrome history is important the text textbook description of acute coronary syndrome is a, an, an elephant sitting on my chest a dull ache or the retrosternal pressure in the center of the chest maybe towards left side with sweating with some nausea vomiting with some radiation so that is the textbook and there are a number of uh, studies done to assess the likelihood ratios of these symptoms so let's uh think a little bit statistically and think what are the sensitive pages of this textbook description we'll start from the bottom so as i have mentioned here if the likelihood ratio is more than 10 that means it's strongly suggestive of that particular pathology if it is more than 5 it's good evidence if it is less than to moderate evidence so uh, from those likelihood ratios described as pressure retrosternal pressure tightness or constricting type pain has some sensitivity but not strong it is worse than previous angina or similar to previous mi that is the important point in the history associated with nausea vomiting associated with diaphoresis those are the symptoms of critical illness whatever the reason those are symptoms of critical problem going on so those are also sensitive not specific and radiation to left arm so this book this one normally says pain in the left arm that is a little bit lower down in the like to ratio risk pain in left arm is sensitive but not uh, but radiation to right arm or radiation to the both arms are more sensitive than just radiation to left arm so if the patient comes with chest pain to right arm that is more sensitive than radiation to left arm and uh, if the patient is assured with the exertion again it's a positive fact so as you can see any of these like you ratios does not take say 10 so that means you can't rely solely on this uh, historical features to rule in chest pain rule in acute coronary syndrome in a chest pain patient the other hand decrease likelihood if the patient person the pay uh, describe the pain as pleuritic if it is uh, positional if it is sharp if it is reproducible with palpation if it is if there is any inflammatory location if there is if it is this no association with exertion if it is any associated palpitation or associated syncope those are sensitive to exclude a good coronary event but again none of these features cannot exclusively rule out acute coronary syndrome even though patient present with pleuritic pain it can be but the likelihood the likeliness of acute myocardial infarction is less 
but you can't exclude. There are some other features we normally hear when we are doing the word round. This pain sounds like burning, burning type pain. This pain has improved with GTN, so it's unlikely a myocardial infarction. It has, uh, this patient has an abrupt onset of pain. So according to the available studies, these features does not have any meaningful effect to rule in or rule out acute coronary syndrome. So basically, you can't take any decision based on these features. But the previous decision, previous symptoms, you can have some idea, but not 100%. So basically, no single factor in the history alone can control rule in or rule out acute myocardial infarction. And as I said, atypical symptoms are typical. Especially, this is not to discriminate, especially in women, in elderly, in diabetics, you can see lots of atypical presentations. About There are some literature saying that about one third of the patient may present without chest pain, especially these categories. They can come with dyspnea, weakness and, ex dis uh, weakness and extreme fatigue or lethargy, syncope, old and mental status, and sometimes maybe just with chest pain, uh, maybe just with sweating. A uh, couple of weeks ago, very recently, I had a patient, a female patient in his 50s, coming with severe positional pleurity and pain. With, she shouts and she screams with palpation. Ultimately, found to have an extensive enteroviral impact. So that that is not uncommon. This is very common. Risk factors. So I'm not going to go through these risk factors. These are the normal, conventional, and unconventional cardiovascular risk factors that are important for the risk stratification as well. And then examination. Most of the time. These acute consumer patients have no positive examination finding except if they have developed heart failure uh, or shock. So basically, it's, it's not that helpful, but there can be some evidence. ECG. So basically, within 10 minutes, any chest pain has to have an ideal, uh, then ECG. What, the, what you look at is new ST segment elevation, so depressions. New Q wave formation, new conduction deficit, like left valve branch block, and T wave peaking or T inversion. These are sensitive, not specific. And uh, depending on these features, you can categorize this patient as got, whether he has got an occlusion MI, or got a semi equivalent like Collins, D Winters. Something like that, and with the patient was non stemmy so that I'm not going to go into detail into de uh, into detail of the ECG analysis. So I think I'm pretty sure it will be covered in another lecture. And the uh, important thing is, normal ECG does not completely exclude a patient uh, and acute myocardial infarction or acute coronary syndrome in a patient who is having chest pain, suggestive chest pain. Again, check x ray, you can take it, but it's basically to rule out other uh, other diagnosis. And troponin, uh, you have conventional troponin, you have got high cell troponin, and now we are in the era that we are talking about delta troponin or the change of troponin levels. So those can be used, and the focus or the point of the ultrasound scan can be used to see the signs of heart failure, and we can see the ball motion abnormalities to help with our uh, ED decision making. And uh, it is very helpful to explore the causes as well. Okay, so based on the diagnosis, whether it's STEMI, non STEMI, you have different pathways of management. So that I'm not going to talk about that, it's beyond my scope of the lecture today. So I'm pretty sure you will have a separate lecture for that. But you now know patient has got a significant so that, so that you will not send the patient home. And for the, if the patient is having obvious stem, obvious transit, that is a different thing. If the patient is having very benign pathology, it's a different thing. In between, 
there are patients whom we can't take a decision. What is the risk for this patient to have a major adverse cardiac event? So there are a number of scoring systems we have been using in the past. Basically, we are well aware of TIMI score, GRE score, but hard score and EDEX score, those are more emergency department oriented. And those are heart and EDEX score are addressing the chest pain patients as opposed to TIMI and GRE score where we address already established diagnosed acute coronary syndrome patients. So what we need to do is to re-stratify these patients to see whether what is the risk of this patient of having a major adverse cardiac event within next six six weeks or two months. Major adverse cardiac adverse cardiac event means either death, either myocardial infarction or revascular strategy. So that we will be pretty sure if we are sure uh, we will be pretty confident and pretty comfortable if we are pretty sure that uh, the patient belongs to a low risk category based on these three stratification tools. So I will not go into major detail, but just to have give you a sm small idea of the heart score. Heart score, heart stand for H E A R T. So history. So that is the history part comes into play there. So whether we feel that this patient has got a suspicious history or not. What are the EC changes? What is the age? What are the risk factors? What are the property and levels? So based on that, we it's, it is giving some scope. If it is less than three, that means low risk category. The chance of major, major adverse cardiac event is less than 2.5 with the help of uh, new high sensitivity troponins. Uh, it has come down to 1%. Actually, those are the patients, if we have a proper uh, follow-up mechanism, those are the patient we, patients we can think of discharging from the emergency department. As I'm aware, in some of the emergency departments in the in our country where emergency physicians are working, they are using the hard score uh, and at, this, at the moment I'm also trying to implement this full hard path in my hospital, but there should be some kind of system and uh, space and uh, to keep the patient for investigation systems and the follow-up mechanism to be arranged to for full implement. But this is the history. Uh, this is going to be the future of emergency medicine so that uh, these patients will be re-stratified in the emergency department and discharge more and more in the future once the infrastructure and adequate facilities are available, especially with the proper referral or proper safety net to make sure that we don't miss any patient and don't have any adverse outcome from the discharge patients. But uh, this is one of the hard pathways being used. So that uh, that is one pathway, but there are some different pathways as well. So just to give an idea, if the patient is low risk, there's a possibility that patient could be discharged once the system is placed and with the appropriate safety network. Okay, ordinary section. Uh, we have got another around 25 minutes. Fine. Briefly, aortic dissection is a rare fatal illness. Incident history, three per 100,000 patients per year. And what happens is, basically, you get a damage to the intimal layer of the aorta and the blood seeps through the intima and the media to create a false lumen. So most of the time, this is due to a damage to the intimal layer and sometimes, not very often, it can be due to a rupture of the, uh, the blood vessel inside the aortic wall, vasa, vasorum, or venum. And this dissection or the collection of blood can 
propagate between the intima and media of the aorta and the driving force is high blood pressure and tachycardia. It's like hammering a nail to a wall. So whenever you hit the nail, it will go in like that. In a patient who has got hypertension and tachycardia, that sheer force can dissect the intimal and medial layers and propagate this dissection. And based on the area, based on the affected part of the aorta, that can be divided into type A and type B. Type A means it is involving the ascending aorta, and type B means it does not affect the ascending aorta. The problem here is once this dissection propagates, on one hand, that will narrow the actual lumen of the aorta, on the other hand, it will block the branch arteries of the aorta, maybe the coronary, maybe the vertebral carotid and subclavian, maybe the renal. So that will give rise to the symptom profile. That is a brief description of the aortic dissection. And in the history, the typical presenting feature is sudden onset, sharp tearing and ripping pain. It's something like it is sometimes described as subarachnoid hemorrhage of the chest. So sharp, sudden onset, severe pain of the chest, which radiates to the back, and uh, it can migrate, and it can present with neurological deficit. As I mentioned, it can evolve the other branches. It can present with neurological deficit like stroke, hoarseness, or sometimes altered conscious state. It can present with acute coronary syndrome. It can present with mesenteric ischemia. It can present with kidney stones. So, kidney stones, so that if the patient present with chest pain plus something else, always suspect audit dissection. Chest pain plus drowsiness, chest pain plus neurological features, chest a deficit, chest pain plus abdominal pain, chest pain plus uric colic like pain, chest pain plus hematuria. Always think of audit dissection. And the risk factors. I am not going to go through all these risk factors, but those are basically acquired or congenital conditions that weaken the structural architecture of the aortic wall. That's how that uh, shear force can damage the intima and dissect through the intima and medium. On examination, these are sick patients. They are diaphoretic, they are hypotensive, they, are, they can be hypertension, have hypertensive, and they can be tachycardic. And differential blood pressures of right and left arm present in about one, part, one fourth part of the patients. New worm, especially aortic regurgitation murmur, can be present. And focal neurology signs can be present in 12%, not much, so that always keep need to keep a suspicion to diagnose that to, to miss uh, patients who present with a pulmonary infarction uh, with an element of aortic dissection. ECG can present, uh, can have typical STEMIs, can have non T or T wave changes, and checks it we have multiple features like wide media steinum, globular heart shape, and uh, pleural effusions. Trachea can go to the right side and left main bronchus move inferiorly. And uh, but about 10% might have normal check six rays as well. And different diagnosis is with the CT autograph or MRI or trans is virtual echocardiogram. As here, as seen here, this is the uh, intimal flap sign, 
where you can see the true and false human with the dissection part. So post focus point of care science can is helpful to identify. Sometimes you can see them dissection part, but most of the time you can see pericard diffusion, so uh, blue refusion with focus. That once diagnosed, so I'm not going to go into major detail in the full management of your dissection, but basically you have to resuscitate this patient. As I mentioned, hypertension is not good, tachycardia is not good, so that you have to reduce the blood pressure if the target of 0 blood pressure 20 to 100 and uh, uh, risk pulse rate target to 6 to 80. So the best drug is IV beta blockers, what we have is labetalol here, and then we can start on vasodilate, not to start with dilated first because that can cause reflex tachycardia and uh, make the things worse. And then this is a cardiothoracic emergency, urgent referral is the key. And uh, there are some risks also for the aortic dissection as well. And uh, as you can see, basically those include predisposition factors I mentioned, and pain features I mentioned, and physical exam findings I mentioned. So based on that score, each, each and every component of this table, there is a mark depending on that we can see whether the patient is of low risk category, which we can do a uh, D-dimer test to, see, to rule out. And if it is high risk, we have to go for the CT angiogram if it is high risk or if the D-dimer is positive. And this D-dimer adjusted ADDR score is not that externally validated, but uh, that can definitely give some idea of uh, the risk assessment of this patient who are having a suspicious pain. Okay, tired of aortic dissection. Now, move into the pulmonary embolism. So, basically, again, uh, about a couple of years before, uh, when I was doing my foreign training, I had a female patient uh, in her 50s uh, who is a known patient with uh, breast cancer on the chemotherapy, active chemotherapy, coming with fever, right side to the chest pain, cough, and fever. So, obviously, that sounds to me like pneumonia with neutropenic in a neutropenic patient. Took an X-ray that is not that convincing, but she's an tachycardia and fever. So that I was not too bothered. I started on antibiotics and doing fluids and everything. Uh, but later, and uh, she didn't have any other features, so she didn't have it swollen legs or anything. But later, uh, she was found to have. Uh, right side pulmonary embolism. The key is I was completely diverted with the history of fever and some lung signs I heard so that uh, even though she didn't have signs of PE, she has got an important risk factor that is active cancer. So I couldn't have thought of that. The patient was fine, but it was <clears throat> It, there was a couple of hours of delay to for the definitive diagnosis so that can happen so they can present with some atypical symptoms let's see what is uh, the historical and examinative features of pulmonary embolism this is not that uncommon these are basically the western data i don't know actually we don't have much of uh, evidence to say in western countries there are lots and lots of pulmonary embolism cases we don't know whether we are under diagnosing or whether actual incidence is low but uh, we don't see much here but uh, always we have to suspect so pulmonary embolism they usually present with dyspnea they can have to do chest pain and substantial chest pain they can have cough hemoptysis and they can present with syncope maybe without chest pain just syncope and uh, risk factors this is important for risk stratification so i will discuss about this risk factors uh, when i'm uh, talking about risk stratification so basically the history of thromboembolic disease pregnancy his family history of venous thromboembolic disease uh, pro prolonged immobilization, major surgery within previous 12 weeks, uh, especially lower limb surgeries which last more than 30 minutes and pelvic surgeries and the fractures of the lower limb and the active cancer. 
and the examination they are tachycardic they can be tachycardic they can be hypotensive if they have in high risk or major cell cell pulmonary embolism they can be hypoxemic and uh, jp can be elevated if it's a big emboli uh pleural lap prop if you are lucky enough to hear that in the bc emergency department you can hear that. and uh, there can be some focal bc in science and there can be some adults or dvt as well okay investigation easy so most of the time what you can see is sinus tachycardia nothing is but there can be some evidence of right heart strain uh i have suddenly muted so can you hear me now can you hear so. but sorry i don't know where i got muted so did you hear this slide or did you hear the last slide so starting from the ecg i think perfect sorry ECG. i think i pressed the button right so basically ecg features are most commonly you can have sinus tachycardia and you can have some right ventricular strain patterns t wave inversions in lateral and inferior leads complete or incomplete uh, right bone branch block right axis deviation p pulmonary you will not be able to see this typical textbook s1 q3 t3 and in this ec you can see this s1 q3 t3 pattern but it's not that common and uh, you patient can present with atrial fibrillation fractures and tachycardia as well chest x ray most of the times it is not that diagnostic but uh, this x ray this actually one of my patients who present with typical history of cholecystitis he came with right hypochondriac pain and having tenes ray of the uh, gold bladder and uh, morphine sign is positive so i initial blood work up was done and uh, uh, i i arranged an urgent ultrasound scan mean time for the completeness of the uh, investigation i did check it straight to see this this which infarctions of the right side lung these are which infarctions those are called hampton lumps so she had the uh, big emboli in the right side uh, pulmonary artery so that those atypical presentations are there so it's interesting but very tricky okay so again with the focus we can see right heart strain or sometimes we can see wall motion abnormalities and some dvt especially if you can't move a patient out of the emergency one if who is peri arrest or who is in arrest due to pulmonary embolism these signs are very important so if you can see dilated right heart with the your scan machine uh, even though we don't have dedicated uh, proper uh, ultrasound or echo you can have some idea of what's going on with the dvt scan and the uh, point of care echocardiogram to resuscitate these patients accordingly so that is very useful okay workup as i mentioned if the patient is having high suspicion of pe with hemodynamic compromise that means patient is having high risk pulmonary embolism if the patient's hemodynamic status is normal or okay that patient have non high risk presentation those non high risk presentations should be risk stratified in order to direct appropriate investigations so i think you have heard about revised geneva score and wales score i am fond of wales score with the wales score you can stratify the possibility of this patient having uh, pulmonary embolism uh, then with is low with is moderate or with is high if it is sorry if it is low you can apply per rule pulmonary embolism to rule out criteria to completely exclude p if it is not possible you can go for the d dimers then uh, if it is positive for for the definitive investigation moderate mean both of them it is a ct pulmonary angiogram or vq scan if the patient is high risk usually you directly go for the imaging so that is a brief overview that have lots of other factors to be discussed so i am not going to discuss in detail and so this is a per criteria uh, to rule out and this is a well score so those are the basically these are touching upon the risk factors i have mentioned in the 
typical clinical features to give them a score. Fine. For the, uh, in summary, for treatment wise, if the pain is high risk or the patient is at hemodynamic instability, so you have to go for either thrombolysis or fibrinolysis with the help place or surgical or catheter directed embolectomy. If the patient does not have hemolytic compromise, you can start anticoagulation. That is the end of pulmonary embolism. So we have got three more. Tension pneumothorax. So we have already managed tension pneumothorax in stabilization, but tension pneumothorax, pneumothorax can be spontaneous in a healthy lungs, which is primary, in unhealthy or diseased lungs, this is secondary. In traumatic uh, chest injuries, so you can see lots of pneumothorax, but I'm not going to cover the traumatic aspect at all today. And uh, the history is very brief, sharp, sudden onset, right, unilateral, prudent, chest pain. And then risk factors for the spontaneous uh, pneumothorax, so smoking, tall thing, uh, patient muffins, pregnancy, family pneumothorax, or passage to pneumothorax is are uh, risk factors. So basically, I think I don't have to reemphasize the uh, clinical features of tension pneumothorax. So I, think I have already mentioned that during the uh, year stabilization part. So I think it's a clinical diagnosis. You don't have to wait for chest X-ray. You don't have to see this X-ray in the emergency department. So that is uh, that is not good. Actually, this has to be identified clinically and managed. So if you have focus, it is helpful in manage, in identifying the possible pneumothorax. If you have any doubt, uh, you can go for the lung sliding, absence of lung sliding, lung point barcode signs and everything. But, uh, so that's helpful. And ED management is basically if the patient is having needle decompression with a needle decompression. Now, the, the current evidence suggests the use of fifth intercostal space mid axial line that is say triangle rather than the second intercostal space mid axial line which is most of the time mentioned in our textbooks so my first goal would be the fifth intercostal space mid axial line rather than the second intercostal space and the this has to be always followed by intercostal catheter with underwater seal okay pericarditis Myocarditis, myopericarditis. Most of the time, these patients present with myopericarditis and pericardial effusion with tamponade. So, the pericardial effusion with tamponade is the life threatening cause. So, they usually present with the symptoms of pericarditis with the symptoms of temper. So, basically, pericarditis pain means atypical, pleuritic, retrosternal, positional pain. So, that this relieve while we sit forward. So if the effusion is there with tamponade effect, there can be some dyspnea, dyspnea, and uh, signs of hemodynamic collapse. Causes, pericardis can be maybe infective, maybe malignant, maybe uremia, so that I'm not going to go into detail, but it can be anything. The cause, the, the actual reason for that effusion and the pericardis has to be initiated later, later. but uh, what you have to manage here is the pericardial effusion with tamponade. So they can be tachycardic, they can have fever, pericardial drop. If they have myocarditis, they might have signs of heart failure as well, like history gallop and uh, elevated JAP. If the patient is having tamponade, that patient can go into obstructive shock with pulses paradoxes. Big stride, you might have heard before, hypertension, muffled heart sounds, and raised JVP. And ECG can show signs of pericarditis changes, diffuse PR segment depressions and ST segment elevation, saddle shape, widespread saddle shape, ST segment elevation in most of the leads except in AVR, where you can see reciprocal change that is ST segment depressions and PR elevations. And uh, if there's any fusion, they can now decrease voltage and they can have electrical alternance as well. Check x-ray may reveal the 
globular heart and focus is very helpful in these instances to identify pericardial effusion or tamponade and especially for training purposes. So the management is urgent need with pericardial senses depending on your uh, the first rates of the emergency department in the hospital you can decide who is going to do that but it's an emergency procedure to be done as soon as possible and then then we can decide what is the reason for that, what are the management for pericarditis with strict monitoring of this patient because these patients can have these effusions reaccumulated, so they have to be monitored very closely. Fine, last of the big six, mediastinitis, esophageal rupture. So the sudden onset chest pain might indicate an esophageal rupture. Basically, if the patient person with sudden onset chest pain followed by a forceful vomiting or retching that is suggestive that pain is typically pleuritic and positional and they can have a social dyspnea and some lung signs as well so the patient who have got recent endos upper endoscopies or any other instrumentations are at high risk sometimes patient with odontogenic infections can cause uh, mediastinitis without this virtual Perforation. So they also can be signs of media stinitis. They are ill. They might have evidence of septic shock, the tachycardic febrile, and so they can have subcutaneous emphysema. They can have some tenoseptic gastric region. Hammond sign, if you are really lucky in the emergency department, you might hear a systolic crunch. I have never heard that. Uh, and uh, so you have to suspect from the history and examination. And ECG, most of the time, non check history as seen here, can have some subcutaneous emphysema, mediastinal gas, and very clear heart border. And sometimes with this uh, widened mediastinal. And they can have two refusions as well. Focus is again helpful to identify flu uh, refusions or neurothorax. So sometimes you can't see anything due to the subcutaneous emphysema. Management is you have to very aggressively resuscitate this patient uh, with antibiotics, and uh, you can prefer you have to refer this patient to counsel six for operative debridement. But anyway, the mortality is high in these patients. Okay, so those are the big six. So those are the most critical diagnosis we need to think of. Uh, most uh, most critical diagnosis we should not miss in the emergency department but there are some other causes as well i'm not going to talk about the all these uh, pathologies but have an idea even though other than these critical illnesses there can be some specific condition we need to be addressed simple neuro maybe it may not be life threatening but it has to be addressed pericarditis without tamponade yes unstable angina yes and pancreatitis those are very important causes to identify and there are some non-urgent causes as well like stable angina and the viral pleurisy pneumonia especially in the history if the patient is having fever cough respiratory symptoms expression of a pneumonia that is diagnostic and post any chest fall injury so those are very benign condition but uh, that has to be taken after excluding uh, the most life threatening conditions. Cholecystitis can present like chest pain and GORD, BD recolic, peptic ulcer disease, all can present. Herpes zoster, another very important diagnosis to be made in the emergency department. One take home point is always if a patient is complaining of pain somewhere in the body, you have to visually inspect. You can't just palpate it, the area under the clothes. So you have to see where it is actually so. If you actually see that, sometimes you can see a rash of the resistor. Sometimes you can see metastatic, uh, you can see a breast cancer. So there are presentation, presentations of patients who, have, who are having breast cancers, just selling, just, just pain, tender. But unless you examine it, you won't detect that. There can be some infection, there can be some abscesses of the chest wall. So those are the things you need to identify and uh, treat 
accordingly. Finally, this is one of the management algorithms. I saw, uh, though there are many management algorithms available in literature. This is one of the my most favorite ones. So let's go through this to have some idea of everything I have already mentioned. So what is the approach of a chest pain in the emergency department, especially with regard to the investigations to be done? First, patient comes with chest pain. My initial stabilization comes first. That is assessment of the vital signs, cardiac monitoring, IV access, oxygen. And if the patient is stable, focus history and examination. If the patient is unstable, we are here. So that we have to go for the AIV breathing circulation stabilization. You have to treat arrhythmias and you have to treat other life threatening causes. And if the patient is having stable vitals, if the patient is stable, then you have taken history and examination, then you take the ECG. And if the ECG is diagnostic or suggestive of acute coronary syndrome, you have to, sorry, sorry for that. So can someone of you tell me whether you could hear me at this point? Halfway through on the slide, uh, you got muted, sir. Perfect. Thank you. And so that you could hear this part. No, I will just uh, go through uh, briefly. So you uh, assess the vital signs and uh, decide whether the patient is unstable so that you have to stabilize the patient. If the patient is stable, you take the ECG to decide whether the patient has got diagnostic or suggestive acute coronary syndrome features. If you have any problem with uh, the connection or the clarity of uh, my talk, please let me know. Sorry for that. And uh, so if the patient is having STEMI, you know what to do. If the patient is non STEMI, you know what to do now. So always have a second thought whether I am dealing with a case of aortic dissection. Just to exclude uh, the aortic dissection. That is very rare, but it's not good to miss that. Fine. And next step. So if the patient does not have typical ECG changes, then you can go for the chicks extreme. Checks X-ray can be diagnostic of several conditions. If the checks X-ray is diagnostic of pneumothorax, you know what to do. Now. So you have to go ahead with the pneumothorax pathway. And if the checks X-ray show, shows wide and mediastinum with the history of uh, history and physical exam plus or minus risk score suggestive of aortic dissection, that is aortic dissection until proven otherwise so have so that you have to go for the definitive investigation that is ct autogram with emergency thoracic surgery consultation and then you might see evidence of heart failure in the check x-ray or pneumonia in the check x-ray and then you can go ahead with the appropriate management of heart failure and pneumonia so that is where you stabilize the patient ECG is not diagnostic of acute coronary syndrome and the check set is showing some possible diagnostic pneumothorax or dissection or heart failure or pneumonia. Assume this patient didn't have any check set ray features. Check set ray, no obvious diagnosis. Then you have to think of other causes. What about PE? So if the patient comes with some kind of pain suggestive of PE, you can stratify the risk of PE with the well score, Berg score or Geneva score. And then you know now, according to the scores, depending on the risk, whether it is low risk, intermediate risk or high risk of PE, you know what are the investigations we have to do. Whether you, whether you can rule out, whether you can have to do a, a D-dimer, or whether you have to do a CT, PA, or VQ scan. Then once diagnosed, you know how to treat now. And then if the check set ray is not diagnostic, even though patient didn't have any obvious signs of acute ECG signs, ECG features of acute coronary syndrome, then you have to uh, do a 
cardiac markers because as i mentioned before history alone ecg alone cannot rule out a coronary syndrome so that you have to add cardiac biomarkers and use risk stratification tool maybe heart maybe tmi whatever it is so if the cardiac markers are positive that is there can be there is some card myocardial damage then you know how to manage that and then if the cardiac markers are negative uh it may not be if the risk is low and if the cardiac markers are negative you have to think of something else some other uh diagnosis like uh diagnosis or increasing or higher risk of having major adverse cardiac event during next six to eight weeks so that we can use the cardiac risk markers and uh, get some idea of the patient's age and decide whether this patient can be safely discharged that means the patient has got some chest pain there's no ongoing chest pain normal ecg normal uh, troponin i maybe serial troponin i and uh, the risk stratification shows that patient's risk is very low so those patients can be discharged home once proper system to follow those patients up is there and if still you feel that patient has got some kind of risk you might need to admit this patient for further investigations and uh, if the patient has got some kind of pericarditis or tamponade again you had to go for the history examination and ecg features to see whether they sense are these two features of pericarditis and pericardial tamponade so that you can have a bit side of some scan to confirm it and treat and that is the, one of the uh, very comprehensive flow charts i found with regard to chest pain management one of the most important thing i need to mention here is even though i mentioned about couple of risk stratification tools these numbers these scores are not just scores always we need to have that scores interpreted with our clinical gestalt so that uh, always clinical sense should be there so that you can't just uh, depend on these risk stratification scores you have to put your clinical knowledge clinical gestalt into the patient management decision making as well so that is basically end of my lecture uh, basically end of my lecture and if there's any question i'm happy to answer thank you thank you very much sir for that very informative presentation it's time to enlighten few queries Uh, so far, we have one question: How to differentiate a new onset ST elevation or depression from old one in emergency department? Good question. That is a great question. So we can't identify unless we have an old ECG. We can't. So always from the history, I mentioned with the patient, you have got similar pain before. What did you do for that? Did you get any ECGs? What are the We are an ECG, so you it, you if you can find from a clinic book or somewhere, you have to see the previous ECG and check whether it is a new one or an old one. If you don't know whether it's an old one, you have to assume it's new. At the same time, even though I mentioned about focus point of care ultrasound scan, sometimes you can see very clearly there are some old motion abnormalities. You but you can't differentiate whether it's new or old. So same story for the left malignant branch block as well. You don't know whether it's new or old. If it is pre-existing, you have to go for the scabose criteria. I didn't mention too much about that, but you will definitely have a similar uh, some talk about this ECG ECGs. So basically, you can't. Um, and on the other hand if someone asks someone might ask about q waves q waves can be a uh, old one maybe a new one but q wave itself does not exclude the exclude the candidate from emergence urgent pci or pre revascularization strategy so that you have to do that 
another question sir drop by duration any limitations yes drop by now uh, we have our conventional drop by nights and now we have got in most of the hospitals and high sensitivity drop by night as well so both these assays measure the same molecule no no difference but the high sensitivity assays can uh, measure a lower level of drop by night levels so that that is more sensitive so for the conventional drop by night what we say is you have to at least wait for 6 hours but in uh, high sensitivity drop by night you can do it within 2 to 3 hours if you do a high sensitivity drop by night before 2 to 3 hours you always need to repeat it in 2 to 3 hours again to see delta drop by that is a change especially for the patient who have got chronic elevation of troponin eyes maybe ckd maybe a cancer might have some chronic elevation of troponin eye for those patients what you need to look for is a rise followed by a fall of troponin eyes so that the things are the limitations wise yes as i mentioned troponin eye can be elevated in some other conditions many conditions so that to always you need to keep an eye of the possible other causes maybe sepsis maybe aortic dissection maybe pulmonary embolism so there are many causes so always have a wide idea and a broad view of the possible causes of troponin eyes um so in gp setup we give aspirin at the end transfer immediately to a hospital is there in instances where they should not be given uh, so if i go through that uh, final algorithm i mentioned so i think this gives a good idea of that so if the patient is stable obtain to early dcg and check the set may the aac if patient low risk for aortic dissection the only thing is if you have a high suspicion of aortic dissection or if even the patient has got aspirin allergy yes you have to avoid the aspirin and atorvastatin is not in the proven list now so it's it's not considered the stat dose now so aspirin is the number one it is proven to be effective and clopidogrel once it's confirmed but atorvastatin stat dose does not do any major change of the to the outcome. how to approach sh presenting with ecg change Mm. So SH, that is a neurological emergency, sudden onset SH. Why you get ECG changes in SH? That's because sudden onset blood in the brain matter. That is a huge stress to the that that can give rise to huge sympathetic drive and can cause huge sympathetic. There's a constriction in the body, which can affect the myocardium and cause a supply demand mismatch, and that can give rise to various non-specific ECG changes that can mimic acute coronary syndrome. That can mimic unstable angina. Uh, sorry, that can mimic the non-STEMI. That can mimic STEMI as well. So there are instances where the patient comes with headache. But due to some reason, the chest pain also have been there, and the patient has got these typical ECG changes, and patient have got fibrosis with the tonic replace. So these incidents are there. So that if the patient has got significant headache, you should not manage ECG changes thinking that is a good marker infarction. until you exclude a uh, intracranial event so basically if the patient has got sh you don't do anything for the is it changes just many this sh um, please explain about ventricular strain pattern yeah ventricular strain pattern is it can be right ventricular strain pattern it can be left ventricular strain pattern so uh what happens is ventricle due to some reason maybe due to hypertension maybe due to uh, pulmonary or systemic hypertension our ventricles have to pump against a bigger afterload than it's used to 
that means it has to work hard that muscles go through a, a mechanism of hypertrophy and at some point they get strained they get fatigued so that there are some changes so that you can see typical if it is left ventricle left ventricle hypertrophic pattern with non-specific T and ST changes, specific T uh, changes specifically in lateral and inferior leads. So that you can have, assume left ventricle hypertrophy with strain. So you can have the ECGs which shows left ventricle hypertrophy uh, and non-specific ST and T changes, especially in lateral and inferior leads. Does propping up cause any harm to pulmonary embolism patients? Pardon, can you please repeat it? Does prop, prop up, propping up the patient cause any harm to pulmonary embolism patients? No, nothing. Unless uh, if, the, if the patient is in shock, obstructive shock due to pulmonary embolism, yeah, that, that patient needs to be li li light supine uh, in order to maximize the brain perfusion, that's all, otherwise nothing. Another question, sir, can you please repeat what you said about Q wave previously? The Q wave is uh, now, the Q waves, if the patient comes with chest pain and a patient has got Q waves, that can be old or it can be new. Sometimes, even though the, the, the development of Q waves have, does, does not have a specific time gap so that even though patient comes with a STEMI, assume that patient comes with a STEMI and patient has got Q waves already, sometimes there's some idea if the patient has got Q waves, patient is not suitable for prevascularization therapy. It's nothing like that. So even though patient has got Q waves, if the patient is having ongoing STEMI and ongoing chest pain, you can go ahead with the uh, fibrinol disease therapy. I think those are the things which should be managed separately in uh, acute myocardial infarction lecture. But uh, that's uh, that is the basic uh, explanation for that. Can you please give a brief explanation on the procedure of needle decompression at fifth intercostal space? So basically, patient get, a patient is in front of you. Patient has got a tension pneumothorax. So basically, it's an emergency procedure. Uh, so you can use a needle, you can use a cannula, but a needle is better most of the time in emergency setups. So fifth intercostal space is the our safe track. So initially, in textbook descriptions, what we read, second intercostal space, mid calcular line. Due to, it is discouraged, I will tell you that, it is discouraged because uh, depending on the patient's body habitus, due to the bulky pec majors, our needles, uh, needle length may not be adequate. On the other hand, if the patient is very thin and if the patient has not got a, a significant hemothorax, that can, and that has a theoretical risk of damaging internal structure. So that to, to be safe and to be more effective, now most of the uh, places they advocate using fifth intercostal space, that is fifth intercostal space in between posterior, sorry, mid, mid and anterior axillary lines, just lateral to the pic major, just clean it. And then uh, one thing is, if you are in a really hurry, you can just put the needle in or else you can uh, put a syringe on with some air and then you can insert it while withdrawing so that you can see bubbling of air to the syringe. Then you can remove it and decompress it very easily. Uh, if clopidogrel type dose is given, is there a problem for primary PCI with relation to risk of bleeding? No. Um, what size of needle is suitable for tension pneumothorax? Usually, when you go for size 14 or uh, less, less means uh, large, size 14 is enough. Uh, there are some bigger uh, dedicated uh, needle decompression cannulas as well. I don't know whether it's available in Sri Lanka. Usual size 14 or less, that means bigger. Okay, uh, 
that's all we've got so far. So if there are no more queries, I would like to thank Dr. Chamura Birugudarachi for his excellent presentation on behalf of GMO Shri Knowledge Academy. Thank you very much, sir. And thank, thank you, you for the much. great thank you for the great audience. Here we are signing signing off today. Have a good day. See you next week.